Well, how do you like living in Manhattan? Costello. Okay, so we want to begin. If you could all take your seats, um, please. Thank you. We have a full house tonight. We sold out, so that's great. That's terrific. Thank you all very much for coming. Welcome, and if you have been here before, welcome back. My name is Shirley Bachar. I'm the Director of Public Programs at the American Jewish Historical Society uh, here at the Center for Jewish History. The Center for Jewish History is home to five different partner organizations. The American Jewish History Historical Society is just one of them. Um, other than AJHS, we have EVO, the Yiddish uh, Research Institute. We have the American Sephardi Federation, the ASF. Young Yeshiva University Museum, and LBI, um, the Leo Beck Institute for German Jewish History. Uh, the American Jewish Historical Society is very, very, very pleased to welcome David, Hasia, and Lauren, who are here tonight to launch two really, really beautiful, wonderful, groundbreaking books um, tonight. So welcome, and thank you so much for doing this. Um, just a few words about AJHS. Uh, we're um, the largest and oldest, not only Jewish, but actually ethnic um, archive in this country. So we actually are home to over 30 million documents, manuscripts, books, pictures, uh, photos, and, 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 and objects um, over like five, five floors of, of stacks. Um, and we were founded in 1982. So... 1892. <laughs> Not, <laughs> that, that sounds so much less compelling. 1892, 126 years ago. Um, and as part of our mission to collect and preserve um, materials re related to American Jewish history, we also do public programs really on a variety of topics that are related either directly to the archive or thematically. Uh, in all sorts of way, ways, and and oh, we ha we have here materials related um, to the books, actually, um, specifically to Eddie Cantor and Sophie Tucker. And so this is the note that I want to start with uh, here, um, just to give you just like a sneak peek to uh, two photographs that we have in our archive. Um, this is one of them. This is Eddie Cantor at the Surprise Lake summer camp at, uh, at uh, around 1930. And this is uh, this, this picture we pulled from the UJA Federation collection. Um, and so this is one picture. We, uh, we, uh, we have the actual picture. The other picture that we have is of Sophie Tucker at the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. Uh, around the 1960s, and this is from the Hadassah collection. And so this already gives you a little bit of just like an insight as to, you know, the, the kind of the, the politics, right? Politics of representation, like the politics of public fundraising. These organizations are recruiting these big stars to, to fundraise, right? But also this is an educational mission and also a representational mission. Um, these actors are, 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 are recruited, they're joining. Uh, the mission, but they're also uh, putting their face out there. And so this is just like really one thing, and I'm sure we're going to touch on uh, tonight. Um, so, and with David and Lauren, who wrote the beautiful books that they did, we have here a wonderful, really beloved moderator, Professor Cassia Diner. She's the Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at New York University. A thinker, a writer, um, a historian, um, really so many uh, topics in American Jewish history, minorities and immigration and women and gender, and really a leader too. Um, so we're very, very happy that she's also on our academic council of the AJHS. Um, we're going to uh, stick around for about an hour of talk, and then we're going to have 15 more minutes of Q&A. Um, and after that, you're all going to want to 
buy the books <laughs> and have them signed, I promise you. So we're going to go right outside, not downstairs, but right outside. They're going to sit and sign their books and we're going to sell them. And it's going to be fun. We're going to be good. Um, and so thank you again all for coming. I hope I didn't miss any, <laughs> any point. And um, we're going to start off with you. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Okay, how's that? Yeah. Okay, I have to only have one hand because of an encounter between a knife and an eggplant. So, um, what can I say? So, I just want to say before introducing the two speakers um, that the program is also being sponsored by uh, the Goldstein Gardner Center of American Jewish History at NYU, and um, of which I guess I'm the director, and uh, it was a program I would have done at NYU had it not been done here at uh, the American Jewish Historical Society. So it's a wonderful marriage of um, uh, and common thank interest. You so much. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce the two speakers, and then they'll speak, and uh, then I'm going to ask them a few questions, which will just give them uh, more opportunity to uh, contemplate uh, uh, their work, and uh, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, the question was what order we were going to do this in, and should it be uh, Lauren first, because her last name starts with A, and David with W, but I decided let's give our private place to the uh, two amazing performers uh, who I think really transformed American Jewish popular culture. So we'll do Cantor first, and then uh, Tucker. So David Weinstein, parenthetically, who was my former student at the University of Maryland, uh, is a historian who lives and works in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, he's the author of uh, uh, The Eddie Cantor Story, A Jewish Life and Performance in Politics, and also an earlier book, The Forgotten Network, The Dumont, Dumont and the Birth of American Television. He's a senior program officer at, um, in the Division of Public Programs at the National Endowment for the Humanities, and holds a PhD from the University of uh, Maryland. So, um, that will be the, the, our first presenter. And secondly, uh, Lawrence Skleroff is associate professor of history uh, at the University of South Carolina, where she has been on the faculty since, since 2005. She's the author of Black Culture and the New Deal, The Quest for Civil Rights in the Roosevelt Era, and again, the wonderful book that we're celebrating and learning about, uh, Red Hot Mama, The Life of Sophie Tucker. Uh, her work has uh, appeared in any number of uh, uh, um, uh, public uh, media outlets, Los Angeles Times, Salon, Chicago Tribune, uh, and um, she is a um, really up-and-coming figure in the field of American Jewish history, and her next book uh, that she's beginning to work on is on Judaism and homosexuality among uh, famous Jewish artists and entertainers. May I ask, please, that the speaker stands up. Nobody in the back can see anything. Oh, maybe just, just just for me, and the others are going to stand, stand up. up. Okay. Thank, you. Just, Thank you. Hold it closer. It's okay, well, that is all I was going to say, <laughs> and now I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to David Weinstein. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. I really want to thank the AJHS for inviting me. Thanks especially to Shirley. Annie Pollan, thanks to the Goldstein Gorin Center and NYU. I'm really thrilled to be on a panel today with Lauren and Hasia. And thanks to all of you. I really appreciate your coming. And I think Eddie and Sophie would probably be happy, especially the sold out part. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I have a brief presentation. I'm going to discuss the writing of the Eddie Cantor story. Then I'm going to give you a brief overview of Eddie Cantor's life, review a few key, key themes from the book, and then I have a clip to share with you. Uh, this book was a labor of love for me. I worked full-time, as Hasi mentioned, at the NEH. Uh, this was, my views today are not those of the NEH. This was a personal project, a very personal project. I would wake up around 4.30 in the morning, write till about 6.30, go to work, edit a little bit on the Metro, wake up, do it the next day. Um, I have a very tolerant family, and they were very willing to uh, 
not only they indulge that, but choose family vacation spots based on their proximity to Eddie Cantor archives. <laughs> so I was able to travel all around the country, and um, including here, of course. If you're doing Jewish research, all roads lead to the Center for Jewish History and the AJHS. So I found a tremendous amount of primary materials uh, that became the foundation for the book. In fact, the cover of the book uh, is a slide that Shirley uh, showed earlier. This is from the AJS, the 1957 photo, and it shows Eddie Cantor raising funds for the United Jewish Appeal. Uh, the subtitle of my book is The Jewish Life in Performance in Politics. And when I saw this photo, I just thought it was perfect. You see Cantor performing with the big eyes, holding this giant telephone, and you can also see some of uh, the political activity, uh, working for refugees, he's engaged in Jewish philanthropy and politics. And these were themes that I uh, followed through the book. So who was Eddie Cantor? Uh, he was born Isidore Iskowitz, January 31st, 1892. He was the child of Russian immigrants. That's a photo of him at age seven uh, on the Lower East Side. He grew up in a series of Lower East Side tenements, and he was an orphan. His mother died when he was two. His father either died or left the family shortly thereafter. And he was raised by his grandmother. There's a picture of her there, Esther Cantrowitz who changed the family name from Cantrowitz to Cantor. Uh, at age 16, and that's a picture of him around that age, Cantor went into show business. The year was 1908. Cantor had dropped out of school, and he had no other prospects at the time. He worked his way through vaudeville, then Broadway, and producer Florence Ziegfeld hired him in 1916. From 1916 to 1955, Eddie Cantor starred in every popular medium and every popular format. He was big on Broadway, he danced, he sang, he acted in musical reviews. He headlined 11 different shows. Many of these shows traveled around the country. He made a number of popular records, making Whoopi, You'd Be Surprised, If You Knew Susie. He was all over sheet music during a time when sheet music was enormously popular, and a piece of sheet music could easily sell a half million copies. <coughs> he was huge in silent film during the 1920s, he was huge in sound film during the 1930s. He wrote books. As early as 1928, he published his autobiography, My Life is in Your Hands. He wrote a number of popular joke books during the Great Depression. He had a popular radio show from 1931 to 1949. He was popular on early television from 1950 to 1956. And he was very savvy about how he used his fame. Not just to sell, not just to entertain, not just to sell sponsor products. He used it to promote a range of charitable causes. For example, he worked closely with the March of Dimes, the American Legion, the Red Cross, war bonds. And in, these book, in the book, I discuss these activities in terms of Cantor's image as a patriotic uh, Jewish American. <coughs> Cantor also worked especially closely with Jewish groups, such as Hadassah, UJA in Israel bonds, and he used this work to make broader political statements. For example, he was one of the country's most prominent anti-Nazis during the 1930s. Cantor realized the stakes were high, and he framed it, uh, his activism in terms of who belonged in America and American identity. He frequently affirmed his Americanism by speaking against bigotry and against prejudice. And he wasn't afraid to go after particular anti-Semitic figures like Father Charles Coughlin, and Henry Ford. And this activism really cemented Cantor's status within the Jewish community as a hero and as a role model. But at the same time, Cantor paid a great price for this activism, personally and professionally. He received many death threats, many threats of boycotts, and he ultimately lost his radio show for a year, from 1939 to 1940, during a time when radio was arguably the dominant medium in America. This was after a speech he made in 1939 criticizing Coughlin and others. So my key takeaways at this point are Cantor succeeded in multiple media over a long period of time. He was one of the most popular figures in America. And he proudly identified as a Jew at times where it was some, when it was difficult and sometimes risky to do so. And these were some of the themes that I developed through the book. Uh, the best way to really learn about Cantor is to read my book. <laughs> the second best way to learn about Cantor is to watch him perform. So I'll, I'll end with the short clip of Cantor singing the song Making Whoopi. 
This is from the film Whoopi. It's a 1930 film based on the Broadway play. And the reason I chose this to end uh, my brief uh, opening is that uh, you see Cantor's talent. You get a sense of his humorous delivery, the eye rolls that he was known for. He dances, he sings. Uh, from mentioning it, it seems like most of you know Mike and Whoopi. I mean, today it's not only a standard, but it's sweet, nostalgic, romantic, even sexy. Think of Michelle Pfeiffer and the Fabulous Baker Boys. Think of jazz instrumentals that you hear. Initially, it was a lot more subversive. It was part of a Broadway play and a film that parodies conventional notions of love, of marriage, even of masculinity. The song seems to celebrate a wedding, but if you listen carefully, it's not very romantic in the conventional sense. And this was typical for Cantor. He enjoyed this kind of subtle, slightly subversive social commentary. So I will... Uh... Oh no, we were having trouble with this before.
at the same time and for us to be in New York with all of you to talk about them. A lot of people look at me and say, how did that young woman know who Sophie Tucker is? Okay, and that may be what you're thinking, right? And here is the story. I didn't know who she was 10 years ago. Okay, I was trained as a historian of African American uh, performance and, and civil rights. And I wrote my first book on African Americans, mostly. And I came across Sophie Tucker when I was teaching a class. And what I found was, here is this woman who did basically everything that David just outlined in terms of Eddie Cantor, yet everyone has heard of Eddie Cantor. And no one has heard of Sophie Tucker. Okay. Um, what I learned was this was a woman who broke down boundaries. And this was a woman who defied convention. And when I found out, through Anne-Marie von Russell's help, who's here right now, the curator at the New York Public Library, that she left behind 400 personal scrapbooks that no historian had really looked at in depth, uh, this was a gold mine. Okay, people, famous people don't do this sort of thing. So I had a personal archivist to help me, and Sophie, to learn about her life. I learned, a, I would say, a lot from Sophie. Okay? Um, some good and not so good. The most interesting thing about Sophie was her ability to connect with people. Okay? Sophie mastered the art of live performance in a way that most entertainers of her time could not, beginning her career in 1907 and moving through her death in 1966. And like Cantor, she started in burlesque, vaudeville, then moved her way through cabarets, radio, uh, film, television, Broadway, and of course published her autobiography in 1945. And of course, also during her life, also donated her scrapbooks to the New York Public Library so everyone could learn about her experiences. She was the daughter of Jewish immigrants, but had a passion for the stage, and left her family, left her infant son, uh, around 20 years old, to move from Hartford, Connecticut, to New York City to become a star. And unlike Eddie Cantor, Sophie was a woman. <laughs> and she had a whole lot of obstacles to confront, because not only was she a woman, but she was not a conventional starlet. She was not conventionally beautiful. She was considered overweight. She was funny. Women weren't supposed to be funny back then. Okay? Um, and she was brassy, and she was bigger than life in all sorts of ways. And what she did was she managed to create networks that connected her with fans across the country. Everywhere she went, she would say, can I have your, can I have your card? Can I have your phone number? When I come back in town, promise to see me? And those fans would write to her, and she would write back. And that correspondence lasted almost 60 years. And those letters are in the scrapbooks at the New York Public Library, and some at many, actually, at Brandeis University. So this has been, looking at Sophie's life has been a window into not only this one woman, but the book is very much about the larger world of how mass amusements were made in the first half of the 20th century. Sophie was both representative of Jewish immigrants of her time, but she was also extremely uh, unique um, because she had a kind of longevity that her counterparts, especially her female counterparts, did not have. We all know who Shirley Temple is, right? Well, Shirley Temple was only famous for about 10 years, okay? Sophie Tucker was famous for over 50. And so, Learning about her is not just learning about the experiences of this person, but also learning about historical memory as well. Why we choose to remember some people and not others. And why we, why we record the voices of some and not others. Sophie's Judaism was very, very ambivalent. Um, she was open, open about being Jewish with some audiences and more closed off with others. And 
Like Cantor, she was very, very passionate about Jewish causes and raised over $4 million for charity in her lifetime. Some for Jews in America and in Israel and in Britain, but also for Episcopalians, Catholics, and African Americans. So my story connects um, Sophie not just to the Jewish community, but it explains the ways in which she crossed racial and ethnic boundaries as well. Um, again, I'm very, very interested in racial exchange between ethnic and racial groups. That's what I'm trained in. And so one of the appeals of Sophie is her deep connection to the black community. And in fact, many people thought she was black. Um, I'm going to move through just a few pictures. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just want to show you a few things. Of course, this Sophie um, was not only famous in the U.S., she was um, a transnational star. She spent a good chunk of her time in the U.K., and this is a photo of her, uh, of crowds outside standing to see her in, in, in Whitechapel in London. Um, she had a big following in London and um, later all over the world. Um, one, one thing I talk about in the book is her role as mentor to younger starlets, and the most famous one was, was Judy Garland, but um, she was somebody who really pushed and advocated for those who were behind the curtains, who worked on costumes, on settings, on makeup, chorus girls who really never got heard. She was a voice for people who were not the headliners, and it was because she had had such a difficult time coming up in the business. Um, Sophie was a pioneer in jazz. She was recording what was conceived as jazz music as early as 1915, fronting a band of male performers. Uh, one of, again, she was presenting jazz for the masses, something white women could do at the time, but here she is with her five kings of syncopation. So I talk a lot about her as a, as a musical pioneer as well. This is one of the scrapbooks, okay, um, from the New York Public Library, just so you can get a, a bit of a sense of what they look like. You can see how big it is, and again, it came on a big cart, and um, going through pages and pages of this is how we as historians come up with, um, with, with, with these books, along with uh, many, many other materials that were related to her. This is, um, this is Sophie and her mother, Jenny Abuza. You might be wondering, well, where did the Tucker come from? Um, the family, Sophie was born Sonia Kalish, and the family changed their name to Abuza to avoid anti-Semitism. Um, Louis Tuck was Sophie's first husband, and then she changed her name to Tucker. Uh, but she was Sophie, Sonia Abuza uh, growing up, and um, the many names of Sophie Tucker again, very much like Eddie Canner, echoes a theme in Jewish history that people take on multiple identities to, um, to work within a, a very kind of difficult uh, environment sometimes. And this is, so this is Sophie and her son Albert, who again, she left as an infant, had a very um, spotty relationship with and saw very little during his childhood. And this is something she always lived to regret. Uh, well, no about regret, but feel guilty about. <laughs> and um, in many ways, this uh, this memorial she left, as a, in terms of the scrapbooks, was in, I think a justification for uh, of, of the fame that that came with uh, leaving this child. Um, and here she is with her family, her her sister, her brother, um, and her mother. And um, again, she had. Uh, a rocky relationship with her mother and her brother and her sister later accompanied her when she traveled all over the world. So one thing you'll see when, when the book starts out is Sophie started out in blackface and uh, was billed as a coon chowder and so this is um, a, a program from one of her earliest performances, at least documented earliest, refined coon singer and um, this would have been a very common way to describe sing singers of the day, and this is the way that many, especially Jewish singers like Kanner, um, got, got their uh, grounding in show business. And here, this is actually Sophie in blackface. Um, she's not 
it, it's not the same menstrual makeup that you're normally used, you know, see in these sort of grotesque pictures, but she does have a kind of lighter black face on that she learned to perfect. She's wearing a wig and singing minstrel songs. So again, this is from her very early career, but she was doing this sort of work for about three years. Um, again, just to show you this, this is, this is, these images are not in the book, but there's a lot of description of, of coon singing. Um, and one other thing that Sophie did was she mastered the art of self-management. She learned this from William Morris, her agent. She was one of the first clients of William Morris. And Morris really uh, helped her develop herself into a national brand. Sophie was not just a woman. She was on the boxes of candy. She was on Lucky Strike ads. She was in fashion ads. She branded plus size clothing. Um, she was somebody who was a product onto herself. And Morris was very influential in making this happen. And again, I don't want to take up too much time, but. Um, just to show you what some of these early um, recording uh, covers would have looked like. And the cover, of course, of, of some of these days, her most, favorite, her most famous ballad written by African-American Shelton Brooks. Anyway, so these are some of, the, some of her later, later outfits. And my favorite one, which I don't know if we can... <laughs> to mix in the politics, but my country needs me now, because it's in one awful fix. You men have been running the USA for years, you've had full sway. I think it's a crime and just about time that the women had our way. You men have ignored the women, have always been unfair. What we need is a woman now in the presidential chair. I ran for president four years ago, but Mr. Truman got in. Like William Jennings Bryan, I keep on trying, and this time I'm going to win. My presidential boom is going to be big and strong, and from now on, you'll hear this campaign song. Sophie Tucker, the president, your candidate for 1952. On the day that I'm elected, all you gals have been neglected will be furnished with a lover tried and true. <laughs>
Because when I get through with those guys, they'll have no strength to be to me. <laughs> the difference between war and peace, one fact you can't ignore. No man yet has ever said, I've just had a darn good war. So <laughs> Obviously, those who are amazing, and I, I was hoping to hear my Ida Shamal. <laughs> uh, that's okay. This was amazing. I'd never heard it. So I have a few questions for um, uh, David and Lauren, and um, you can respond to them at, at you know pretty much at the same time, or you can punt them and go to the next question. But I'm um, certainly interested in. Um, Actually, let me begin with what, what I see as one of the uh, most intriguing uh, uh, matters here. Um, so many scholars, as well as public, you know, sort of commentators about the American Jewish past, have talked about uh, the way in which popular culture, uh, the popular uh, presentation, you know, entertainment, uh, to force Jews to uh, put their Jewishness. Uh, into a somewhat, uh, uh, a, a, a certain degree of obscurity, and to kind of hide it, to try to pretend to be every man or every woman, uh, and that their Jewishness was a problem in one way or another. Uh, but yet here we have two people who uh, were both widely received by the American public and made no uh, effort to hide who they were, where they came from, what their uh, um, ethnic, religious, whatever we want to call it, uh, background. Um, so how did um, their careers, uh, in some ways, uh, how does the thinking about their careers put some uh, doubt into this general paradigm, uh, this general observation that they couldn't be Jews in public? So David, you want to start? Sure. Um... That's a great question. I think one of the important contributions in, about the Cantor made is that he really redefined how Americans, non-Jews especially, saw Jews starting in the 1920s, even the late 19-teens, and the possibilities for Jewish performance. When he starts his career in the late 19-teens, there are two dominant modes of Jewish performance. There are either sort of gross stereotypes, the sort of green horns, or the big nose, big hat Jews, or as Hasia mentions, many Jews did hide their Jewishness. Cantor comes on and he shows Jewishness as something that's fresh, creative, fun, modern, through a lot of his sketches, through his humor, and he's working in codes a lot of the time. So he'll mention, he'll give a phrase, he'll talk about a Jewish holiday, he'll make a reference to being kosher. Jewish audiences will get it, non-Jewish -Jew audiences might not, because he's also trying to appeal to the broader American audience. But over time, those references become more Jewish. Let me, um, let me give you an example. 1922, he does a sketch uh, with, where he plays a cab driver. There's somebody from out of town in his cab, and he takes advantage of that person from out of town. They call a policeman. The policeman takes Cantor's side. He's the fast-talking, slick cab driver. Then they find out that they're all Jewish. They bond over that. And they chase the vendor of the Dearborn Independent off the stage. That was, that was Henry Ford's anti-Semitic newspaper. The reason I mention that, it's a good example of how Cantor worked. If you get the Dearborn Independent reference, you'll get it and you'll see you know, the sort of broader Jewish implications. So he's constantly going back and forth, but he's not hiding the fact that he's Jewish. He's playing Jewish characters. You're laughing with them, not at them, which is an important contribution. And that continues. And in many ways, he's setting a model for Jewish performance that continues to this day, whether it's the quick references you either get in the or you don't, uh, playing a range of different recognizable Jewish characters without a big sign above his head, I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish. A lot of it is working through reference archetypes, the nevish, different types of Jewish characters that he's bringing to stage, and he's constantly moving among them. So let me just stop there. Okay, Lauren. Yeah, and 
for sure, Sophie also, I think, worked in codes, but she was, I, I would say, much less open about being Jewish. Um, she was, in, in talking about her songs, she always conveyed a sort of universal message that these songs um, related, and Yiddish Mama being the best example. She openly said in the press, this is not a song about Jewish people, this is a song about loving your mother. And, um, and she also you know, shifted where she went. So if she performed for largely Jewish audiences, and sometimes she would warm up with Jew Jewish audiences before doing a really big show because she got nervous. Um, but she would not, um, sh she was very careful to um, kind of, I wouldn't say hide, but to appeal to mass audiences through a persona that she had developed. This, you know, red hot mama persona that was um, sort of rooted in a lot of Jewish tropes, but not overtly Jewish, and not until later did she really talk about herself um, in terms of being a Jewish performer. Um, she always was very, very careful to, um, again, be part of what she saw as larger trends in entertainment. Um, she wanted to be a popular entertainer. She did not want to be a Jewish entertainer. She did not, she says, I, I did not want to be part of the Yiddish theater. They did not make any money. No, I, no. I, <laughs> I want to be, right, I want to be Nora Bays. I want to be Lily in the right. That's who I want to be. And, um, and so a, a lot of her choices were defined by kind of market enterprise. They were not defined by religious beliefs, um, at least in terms of her um, her, her career. In terms of her private life and what she was doing on behalf of Jewish refugees and Jewish organizations, that's a very different story because she was very, very active um, in terms of uh, helping other Jews. But in terms of her you know, public uh, persona, we remember her as Jewish and certainly people identify her as Jewish. But if you look at Variety talking about Sophie Tucker in 1922, you won't want to see the word Jewish in there. Um, just she wasn't advertised that way. Um, so again, there are references to things. Um, there are songs sung in Yiddish, but she also sometimes didn't sing them in Yiddish, or she would explain why she sang it in Yiddish and why Episcopalians should be able to relate to that because she had long-standing relationships with, uh, with priests, with pastors, and she received Easter cards her entire life. Um, she received Christmas cards her entire life. So again, um, people perceived her as kind of being this much more universal figure. Okay, great. Okay, uh, let me, the next question, uh, which uh, is different for uh, Sophie versus uh, Eddie, if I may no. refer to it like our first days. So, I mean, the uh, the piece uh, that you played of uh, uh, her, you know, her, her that that you ended with was obviously so highly sexualized and uh, uh, so, I mean, I, one might say. Uh, uh, over the top uh, in terms of uh, playing on um, uh, highly erotic uh, images um, and language, uh, or not erotic, but just sexual. What gave her the license to do that? What let her become and market herself as the last of the Red Hot Mamas? And on the other hand, where's Cantor? And, um, masculinity, and uh, um, I'm thinking a lot about Whoopi, which I think is one of the greatest movies of all times. So maybe you'll think you're... Sure. Um, the Cantor masculinity is really interesting. Um, he presented many different kinds of roles, and I think one of the things of Cantor to keep in mind is he's really rebelling in many ways against the conventional Victorian or progressive views of marriage, as you saw him with the, of conventional gender roles. So he's constantly taking on different roles even within a play like Whoopi or on his stage, in his stage roles. 
he'll be rolling around with a man in a chiropractor skit that became very famous, and he'll say, kiss me in the middle of it. Then the next thing you know, he'll be making jokes about what is your wife doing after our appointment type thing. He's hard to pin down, and I think that he enjoyed playing with these gender roles. And in some ways, again, it was part of almost a sort of rebellion. There's something a little bit scary about a guy wearing a dress in blackface on a stage, which is what he would do. You can't really classify him. And I think he had to... Well, it's... Well, it's it's hard. He's constantly slipping back and forth also. And I think he liked that. And I think it's even part of a broader vision for America that he had. A more inclusive vision, but also one that was not conventional that would, and challenged a lot of conventions. Um, at the same time, he frequently played, or early in his career, he would play the man about town, sometimes even wearing blackface, talking about taking white women around town. So he's constantly sort of playing with barriers and using gender as one of the ways in which he's doing that. Okay, so your question, what gave her the license? Well, so first this is 1952, okay? So she had, by this, by the time that that record came out, and, and by the way, the record is, is, from what I understand, much more sanitized than her live performances, okay? <laughs> um, the live performances are, from, again, from what I understand, it's, I don't know because live performances are impossible to capture, but um, from what the reviews say, she, she's, she's pretty out there. What gave her the license was is that from a very early age, she realized that because she wasn't conventionally beautiful and because she wasn't going to be a skinny, you know, um, starlet, that she had to ca she had to cash in on something else. And what that was 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 her humor and her ability to be uh, self-effacing, her ability to poke fun at her own marital marital woes. And so, part of her own expertise on you know romance comes from her own foibles and from her ability to say, right, all women need a woman for president, and that woman is me because here's what I'm going to do. She can say that because everyone thinks she's joking, right? And everyone thinks, she, you know, this is a woman who can talk about sex because she's not sexy. And because at this time, she's 70. So there is also that, right? The idea that she, this isn't Mae West. Um, this is somebody who, through her life, had built up a reputation as somebody who was, you know, sort of, um, had, had, had hard luck in love. And because she was fat, and because she was misunderstood, and um, because men didn't really take care of her, that's that's the reputation she built. But she also built this reputation as a powerhouse, as an industry powerhouse. So it's this interesting combination between somebody who had, again, a lot of personal trouble and whose cabaret work was all about that personal trouble, but also somebody who was making as much money <laughs> as most men at the time. Um, so, so again, she, she understood both um, the, you know, the ability to bring in people and also to change the routines. By the time she did, you would have never heard Sophie Tucker for president in 1915. Okay? But by this time, she's able to record it on Sophie Tucker's Hot Spicy Songs. She's able to market herself in a new way. She's constantly changing her branding. And she's moving with the times. But again, this kind of frankness, especially a record, recorded frankness, she was being frank in person, but she was not being frank recorded, um, is something that she gave herself the license, she earned the license to do um, for, very, for very, very interesting reasons. Okay, great. But one of the unavoidable issues in um, dealing with um, these two performers, and uh, one which I think uh, is... Uh, vexes uh, scholars and uh, other commentators on American Jewish popular culture is the issue of blackface. Okay, uh, It's just there. Okay, It's the issue of blackface. And um, I'm thinking back uh, to Michael uh, Paul Rogan's uh, uh, Blackface White Noise uh, and uh, other scholars who've written about blackface, uh, about Jewish blackface, and have asserted that Jew, Jewish performers used blackface in part to prove their whiteness. Okay. Um, 
So, you are the two uh, experts on two very important uh, uh, performers who um, made their, uh, certainly their initial mark um, through um, uh, corking up their faces and uh, uh, participating in this particular kind of public uh, uh, popular culture mode. So what do you make of them as blackface and how do you see it as part of an, uh, an American Jewish entertainment uh, mode? Which whoever wants to start? Okay, well, the first thing, okay, for so Michael Rogue and, and what this is a this is a political scientist who wrote this um, great book, Blackface, White Noise, and one of the arguments there, not to get too academic, okay, is but is to say that um, Jews enter into this racial disguise in order to come out on the other side Americanized, okay? They put on the disguise to become acceptable as white Americans, okay? Now, when Sophie started in blackface, the reason that she started in blackface is, again, because she wanted to be a star. And the, she was told, the only way you're going to be a star is by corking up. You're too fat and you're too <coughs> ugly, and, but you've got a great voice. That's what she was told. So she did it. Um, she did it to make money. She did it to establish a name in the trades, and she hated it. She talked about um, the way that it, it, it ruined her costumes and the way that she loved performing as herself and now missed doing that. But eventually, she was able to come out of it. And, and you know, one of the things that's really important as historians, you know, we all three of us, work very hard to contextualize these terms. And so coon shouting and blackface and racial masquerade meant something very different in 1907, say, than it does today, of course, right? And that's not to say it was acceptable or we, we applaud these people for doing it, but it meant something different. And racial codes were different. And, um, you know, again, to say, when, when, when asked if she was later I interviewed in Ebony about this in the 1950s, and she said, look, you know, this is what entertainers at the time did, and everybody did it. And it isn't that we didn't think about it, but that this was, the minstrelsy was the most popular mode of American entertainment. It was. You see it everywhere, and, and, and can, these banners in blackface in the 1930s. So this isn't just a kind of turn of the century thing. So if something is the dominant mode of entertainment, if you want to be a performer, it's, it's pragmatism. And what that means is, you know, I'm not up here to say Sophie Tucker is the best human being alive and I love her. She's a complicated woman, right? And she made some pretty awful choices. Um, and, and this one, you know, is it the same choice that Canada made? Sure. Same choice that Al, Al Jolson made? Absolutely. And Fanny Bryce and anybody else who really wanted to be famous, okay? Um, and the question is now, well, would we do it today? Absolutely not. But what were the stakes? And how did these folks, both who, who had, you know, um, who had real interest in African Americans and African American, especially, I mean, the African American uh, representation on stage, Sophie later tried to, um, I think, in, in some ways, um, work against the earlier blackface career by promoting um, integration on stage, by helping those black performers who, who couldn't um, have certain advantages do so, but one can only be so apologetic for what what are the trends of the time. And again, I mean, this is what we do as historians. We, we, we show the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, so anyway. Okay, thank you. David. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, I agree with Lauren. As, what? Show the Okay. Uh, <laughs> I have a clip I'll show you in a minute. Thanks, Sherrod. I think that's a good idea. Um, blackface is one of the most important themes in the book. And as obviously racist and as difficult and even shameful in some ways as it is today, it is important in history. And it's important to contextualize it, excuse me, rather than ignoring it. Eddie Cantor started as a blackface performer in 1909. As Lauren mentioned, it was very common and even trendy for performers to use blackface during this time. I disagree with Rogan that in some way, by putting on blackface, they were trying to be less Jewish. And I think one of the most important 
threads that runs through the book is that different performers use blackface very differently. And to try to generalize about all blackface or all Jews or Jews used it to become less Jewish and more American is not something that I agree with and not something that is supported by the careful research that I did in the archives to try to figure out what do people understand about blackface through history. Um, and what I mean by that is Cantor used blackface, but he was very openly Jewish in using it. The image of blackface that we have, who's the most black, who's the first blackface performer you think of? Al Jolson. On one knee, Manny, how I love you doing the whole southern black thing. Cantor was very different. He very openly played a Jewish character, and he did it for less, which may have been exploitative in its own way, but he wore blackface, and he talked Jewish and act Jewish to, to sort of upend people's expectations, which again is an important theme and one of the things that I found really interesting about Cantor. What did it mean to wear blackface and talk Jewish? One example is the song My Yiddish Amami, which, went, which, was, <laughs> which Cantor performed a couple of years before My Yiddish Amama. It's a different song. I have a Yiddish Amami from the New York Public Library sheet music. She doesn't come from Alabama. Her heart is filled with sentiment. Her home is a black Bronx tenement. He sang it at the Winter Garden Theater, Al Jolson's Symbolic Home, where Jolson was very popular in 1925. And he sang, cut it out with all you Jewish blackface performers, pretend, you know, doing this southern black thing. You're Jewish. And he, and he, that was sort of part of his routine and how he was playing against the perceptions of blackface. Um, I have a clip that I can show, uh, uh, I have a clip from 1929 of Cantor performing in blackface, is that okay? Sure. Um, and yeah. you can see what I mean by the Jewish blackface character, he's wearing blackface, but you'll see he makes a joke about Henry Ford's apology to the Jewish people for Ford's anti-Semitism in 1927. He makes a joke about Jewish business acumen, tweaking Henry Ford, you'll listen for that in a minute, and then you, uh, you can see a little bit of uh, also just as sort of the type of sexual innuendo he did, which was not as up, which was not as explicit as Sophie Tucker's. But you get a sense of how he sort of danced around things, and that may have given him opportunities to perform, you know, in different venues. Uh, let me just pull that up real quickly. I'm just gonna move so I don't block anyone's view. And again, it's hard. Uh, this is a thread that really goes for a long time, and it's. This is from a 1929 film, it's about two and a half minutes to clip. If you close your eyes, you won't even know that he's in blackface. Right. I respond, I give it. Uh, you know, we have a little deal we here a short while ago, and of course we had a lot of automobile men came up here on the roof, some of them with their wives, and uh, one fellow came to me and said he represented the Lincoln agency, and he said, Canada, if you can only use the name of Lincoln, or it doesn't seem to be working. Let me just let's try it again. All right, all right. I respond. I give in. Uh, you know, we had an automobile over here a short while ago, and of course, we had a lot of automobile men came up here on the roof, some of them with their wives. And uh, one fellow came to me and said he represented the Lincoln Agency, and he said, Canada, if you can only use the name of Lincoln or Ford in your monologue someplace, why, we'd be glad to give you a little Ford for pay. Jewishness there. And he's not using blackface to in some way 
assimilate as a, quote, white American, non-Jewish American. And you see that thread, really, through his career. Okay, Shirley, how are we doing on time? Maybe just one quick question. Okay, so quick question. <laughs> how do you, going through the uh, material from the Times, did you see any kind of um, particular uh, response to Tucker or to Cantor from um, Jewish publications and Jewish audiences? Did they embrace them as one of ours? And uh, what kind of uh, sort of field of uh, uh, affinity between Tucker, Cantor, uh, and uh, kind of American Jews in a very uh, <coughs> fraught period of time? Well, again, uh, I mean, I, they loved her, um, and and um, uh, one of the I don't speak Yiddish as as Cassia does, so I had to hire a translator because there were many articles in the Forward and other newspapers um, that talked about Tucker, who was not a Yiddish player but celebrated as one of us um, in in Jewish newspapers and the American Hebrew in. Um, and then in Israel, um, Sophie started uh, two uh, centers in her name in Israel and uh, started traveling to Israel by the 1950s. And so there's a lot in, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv about Sophie and her, not just as a Jewish American, but a Jew um, around the world um, who is being celebrated by different communities. And they're talking about her um, as a philanthropist, as a mother to all, um, as somebody who um, you know has certain values that people are aspiring to. In the very beginning, you saw that wonderful picture of her with the Hadassah organization, and I think that speaks very poignantly to the kind of role that she played for Jews. Because even though you know it's this interesting contrast, right, between the Sophie Tucker for president and then the picture that you're showing of. Sophie with all these kids, and, and, and I have lots of pictures of those that I found the Sophie in hospitals. She had a, a maternity ward named after her in Denver. So Jews, Jews embraced her fully um, in, in America, in Israel, and, 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 in, and in Britain um, in particular. So and uh, the archives show many languages and many many ways of, of expressing that and kind of talking about her as a you know sort of daughter of the shtetl and and, and, and frankly talking about her in ways that she really wasn't willing to talk about herself. Um, that's that's what that's what I saw, which was very very interesting. Okay, that last point is really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cantor also very much. Um, Starting in the early 1920s, it was a point of pride at, during a time when figures like Henry Ford were criticizing show business as being too Jewish and Jews in show business. The Jewish press was very proud of the Jewish performers who were successful in making a contribution to American life, and Cantor was very much at the forefront of that. As he did more charity, got involved with more philanthropies, um, he, again, not only did he receive coverage, but generated a lot of positive press. Through the 1930s, as he became very active working with Hadassah uh, to fight anti-Semitism, to help refugees, that sort of puts him over the top. And there are tons of editorials in the Jewish press praising him as a humanitarian. And that really continues. And I think like Sophie Tucker, Cantor, they worked the crowds. They needed to be with people. And they realized that a group like Hadassah could offer an important community and important support, especially as their careers may have sort of ebbed and waned. As their careers went up and down, they always, or I should say Cantor, probably Tucker too, but had a very strong foundation among American Jews. And even now when I give talks, people will bring photographs from their families. This was my uncle when Eddie Cantor visited the synagogue. Uh, there were tons of tributes. So he really did have a special place in American Jewish homes. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to let you moderate, okay? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, before we open the floor for questions, since we're talking about Hadassah, I, w I wanted to thank uh, a long time Hadassah employee and Hadassah archivist Susan Woodland who helped me find that picture I showed um, uh, earlier. And thank you for being with us 
uh, any questions. And please, if you can uh, stand up and, and raise your voice so that everyone uh, can hear you. Yes, please. Yes, a question for Ms. Falaroff. I don't know if this was a record or maybe it was a cabaret tape I've heard over the years on public radio. Uh, Sophie, she speaks Yiddish at length, but it's in Thai called Make it legal, Mr. Siegel. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that a record or from a cabaret performance? It's a record. Um, it's on Hot and Spicy, Sophie Tucker. Um, so she performed it as in, in her cabaret shows, but it's also on that, the, the face, the record, there's a PowerPoint slide I showed you that has her face kind of cartoonish. And that's the cover of that record. It, it's, on, it's on there with some of her Hot and Spicy songs, and it has that Yiddish phrasing in it. What year was that? 19, um, 1955. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, David, 1939-40, I can shout. Uh -huh. uh, he was taken off for his anti-Ford. Uh -huh. uh, he came back, though, uh, with different network. What was, the, <coughs> what was that story? Yeah, it's a great story. 19... It's a great story, but it illustrates something very difficult. 1939, he's taken off the air for his politics. That's after criticizing not just Father Coughlin, but important industrialists who are behind anti-Semitism. And he's talked about anti-Semitism in the media, in government. His sponsor has enough, takes him off the air. Nobody else will sponsor him. This is a time when the sponsor controls radio. He said that speech at the 1939 World's Fair cost him about a half million dollars. So what does any good Jewish comedian do after he's off the air for Jewish politics? He goes to church. He starts speaking at churches and speaking about interfaith efforts. He speaks generally about the importance of prayer. He finds a way to go to a citizenship meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and praises J. Edgar Hoover's great work. He starts to moderate himself. At the same time, he's speaking out against prejudice through the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And he's working with different multi-faith organizations that are fighting prejudice more broadly, but he's not as outspoken and targeting particular individuals as he was before. And he literally goes on tour. He doesn't have a radio show anymore, so all his radio actors on his show who need work go city to city. He does a lot of community service there, and he literally speaks to churches as part of these tri-faith efforts and starts... He's frequently sort of ahead of the curve and anticipating a lot of... Um, a lot of trends in the country. Of course, the tri... you know, the tri-faith movement really gains more force after World War II. So, by the end of that year, as the country has shifted, as Cantor has shifted, and the topper is his friend Jack Benny calls up the radio, uh, a radio at a sponsor who, he, who Benny had worked with and says, put Cantor back on, calls up the agency. And that person, a man named Tom Harrington, decides to hire Cantor. And I found it amazing memo from the publicist for the sponsor, describing all the reasons why they shouldn't have hired him and all the problems with Cantor, and he bet, uh, saying that he's too outspoken, but he gets hired anyway. He tones things down, and then Pearl Harbor, of course, comes, and he is the first and most outspoken radio comedian in parodying Hitler, and he then sort of resumes his more forceful work, and he says in the press, I warned it about Hitler, I was right, he feels vindicated. Yes, please, all the way in the back. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading both books. I was wondering about when uh, both Tucker and Cantor were coming up in their respective uh, careers, particularly in vaudeville, which times or which circuits they were able to play in terms of geography? Were they mostly urban, or did they pay the smallest birds in the south? Uh, Sophie played everywhere. Um, she started, when, when she started with Gay Masqueraders as a burlesque <laughs> show, before she went into vaudeville, it traveled all over the country. So she traveled all over the Northeast and then over to the Pacific Northwest through Canada. Um, she performed in the South um, and then um, again um, started going to Britain in 1922. So as she got more famous, she would perform um, in higher tier vaudeville wheels. But these wheels still traveled. I mean, the woman d couldn't stay put for a day. Um, you'd just see her moving across the country and into the into the higher tier 
of vaudeville houses, but they were not in any way sort of geographically contained. She did have special places she loved. She loved New York, she loved Chicago, and she loved London, and she had special um, theaters that were her homes when she visited these cities, but um, most of the time she was on the move. Um, and again, I mean, she moved throughout the South and was embraced by the South, as, as far as I can tell. And again, in part because she wasn't um, talking openly about being Jewish or identifying in any way. And, um, and she may have still been singing the, you know, the, the Mammy songs. Um, it, you know, again, it's very, very hard to tell when, when she would have stopped. Yeah, that's a good question. Vaudeville had many rungs and sort of many different levels. Cantor starts off in 1909 playing big houses in places like Utica, New York, Schenectady, New York. He's playing a very small circuit. Then he slowly catches on with another act, and he plays the quote big time with an act called Vidini and Arthur, but he's like the, literally the third man in a two-man act, and he sort of works his way up through that and works his way through vaudeville. People sometimes refer to him as a vaudeville star or a former vaudeville star, and he was never a headliner in vaudeville. It was more of an apprentice system for him, or a way for him to learn from others. And he eventually did have his own act. But it's really only when he finds, when he works with Ziegfeld, when Ziegfeld, I suppose, finds him in 1916, that he makes the big time, Florence Ziegfeld being the biggest producer. So he goes from the very small time to a small part of a big time act to eventually mid-level big time, if those terms make sense. Uh, yeah. A uh, question about hotels, both where they stayed and where they performed. I'm thinking of the film Gentleman's Agreement and how tough was it in that age when there were restricted hotels for them to move around. I'm thinking like Jackie Robinson not being able to stay in the South. What was it like for them in, in terms of America and having restricted hotels? And then with the, regard to playing the hotels, I'm thinking of the Borscht Belt in Atlantic City uh, in its time with these aspects of their, their performing and their entertaining and being significant uh, in connection with their entertainment careers. Um, that's a great question. I did not find any evidence that Cantor encountered any anti-Semitism or any problems in where he stayed. And in general, I found very few instances in which Cantor personally encountered anti-Semitism, which makes some of his activism and some of his passion that much more interesting. Um, one of my favorite routines that he did was from 1938, where he actually does a parody. It's a tribute for him. And he actually talks about Jews being restricted from hotels, which people did not talk about on the radio. Um, so he talked about it in terms of his fight against anti-Semitism, but from what I can tell, he did not encounter it personally, partially because he may have been at a high enough level that it wasn't an issue for him. Yeah, uh, Sophie did not have any problems that I saw either um, staying in hotels. She did employ um, African American band member when she performed in London, and uh, again, didn't see any problem there. That wouldn't have been the case um, in America. Um, but um, she was, again, um, traveling all over the place and often um, often performing in the same hotel that she was staying in. Um, so there was also that connection um, as well. What was, there was another, oh, and Sophie was not part of the Borscht Belt. Um, she performed in Atlantic City frequently, but um, again, that, that was a much later uh, time period, and she by then was, um, you know, a, almost, you know, at the end of her life. Um, so she was not part of that Borscht Belt circuit. Um, but again, um, talked about some of the figures who were part of it and, um, you know, had very, you know, sort of different views. And Sophie was very aware of her own position being a woman among all these men. And she was very close with Eddie Cantor. I think Eddie Cantor 
may have gotten the the, the tri faith thing from her. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, today the canner is writing to her saying, you know, hey, I, I'm so sorry your mother died. She was my favorite person in the world, and when I met her, you know, I I, I wept because you know, I mean, I think Eddie Canner learned a lot from her, <laughs> and and um, you know, she her best friends were Canner, Jessel, uh, Berlin. Um, Jack Yellen. I mean, these are her friends. These, you know, high-powered men, and she was very, very aware of her limit of her limitations, but also um, her abilities among them, and how she kind of, kind of uh, wove and dodged within all of these, you know, not only big personalities, but um, extremely influential men in, in entertainment. We have time for just one last question, yes, please. Um, we know how successful they were in their careers, but did they have any particular regrets? You alluded to something, so I was curious what that might have been and whether Cantor himself had career regrets and didn't get to do something he wanted. Well, she didn't have any career regrets, but, but I think her, her personal regret was um, the relationship that she had with her son Albert. That, um, that the two of them never really were able to have a real bond with one another. Um, but she also was willing to blow him off. And, and, you know, I mean, and she actually kicked him off the stage when he was on there with her because she didn't want to compete with her own son. So, I mean, ambition was, was kind of her middle name. And so while she <laughs> regretted that, I think she didn't have more of a kind of you know, mother-son bond, um, I think she wouldn't have had it any other way that she, uh, again, was the kind of star that she was and that she could provide for, you know, provide for her family, even though her family was, again, sort of fairly well off and didn't need that much providing anyway. They're, they're not, her, her family was sort of middle class and um, she did not support her. She did, as much as she said she supported her family, she certainly gave them a more comfortable life but she didn't support them. They would have been fine had she stayed home and just kind of been a traditional Jewish daughter. Um, and, and very dissimilar to a lot of these other folks who, I mean, you know, the, the, the Marx brothers and you know, other folks who are really, you know, sort of bringing in the cash. Her family was already uh, pretty middle class in Hartford. Um, and, and, and again, raising money for the poor. Her mother was raising money for the poor. Her mother was doing all sorts of things for the home for the aged in Hartford. Uh, they they owned this restaurant. They had borders. Um, they 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 had a nice. I mean, again, she bought them a nicer house, but she didn't buy them a house. Um, so there's a big difference. I really like this question about regrets. Um, Cantor in 1952 had a major heart attack. And as his health declined through the late 50s and early 60s, as a resourceful guy, he wrote a few books, some of which look back on his life, and some of them sort of took the role of the sort of elder statesman giving life advice. And in one of them, he says, if I had to do it all again, I wouldn't have lost so much money in the stock market. I would have been more healthy. And then he stops. He says, nah. I wouldn't have done it any differently. And I think that epitomizes even a little bit of what Lauren's saying about Tucker. These were like high energy, forward looking performers, almost full of energy. And even in their reflective moments, I think certainly professionally, they didn't voice those kind of regrets. They were aware of things. But I think that, uh, I think Cantor looking back felt like he lived a pretty good life. And I would agree. Okay, so, yes, thank you. Um, we're going to do the book signing and book sale right outside on this floor. So if you want to hang out and mingle and talk, please do the talking over there. Um, we have a celebration of Joyce Antler's book on Jewish radical feminism coming up in May 31st. So I hope you come to that. Thank you.
thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 